comic books, conspiracy theories, and a raging global pandemic. I'm only referring to the innocent work of the televised fiction that is Utopia here, so whatever made you wonder otherwise is purely, well, coincidental. So let's actually talk about Utopia, the new Amazon series that David Fincher was famously supposed to be working on before he walked out. Is that kind of a bad sign already? The answer to that is really out of my league, but I have all the trivia that'll lead you to it. So be careful for spoilers ahead if you haven't watched the latest reboot of Utopia, and let's be on our collective way. Speaking of reboots, what I'm about to tell you guys might be common knowledge for a lot of you, but uh, shooting off into this discussion without a basic run-of-the-mill introduction would be like staring at the TV without turning it on, or going on a rebellious adventure against biological warfare only to get bit by a plague rabbit. The point that I want to establish right off the bat is that the utopia we're talking about in this video is an American remake of a British series that is also named Utopia. And uh, this is going to play out a lot in the overall conversation around the American reboot because the original Utopia has a massive, currently pissed off cult following. But there's more on that as we go down this list, so stay tight as we dismantle the nuts and bolts of how Utopia was remade. Utopia picks up on the drama with a young couple discovering a stash of bizarre comic books, and they do what any self-respecting patrons of fine art would do in their place, cash them in for the big bucks. They're lucky to have gotten their hands on these comics that go by the name Utopia and have a fan following strong enough to build an elaborate in-person bidding pool. Goodbye, online retail, who needs your help? But that's not all. There is a subset of the Utopia nerds which genuinely believes that the comic series foretells every major disease outbreak that the real world has and will experience. Gillian Flynn is the creator who brought this vision to life, and about halfway through the series, we're treated to this fleeting visual. It's a cheeky reference to Flynn's own novel Gone Girl, which was adapted into a movie by none other than David Fincher. Utopia could have become a product of another iconic Flynn-Fincher collab, but the production lost out on Fincher due to budget issues. Gone Girl was easily the best option for Flynn when she needed to put a name on the theater billboard since it was her own work. But she didn't pull the brakes on the Easter eggs at that point and went on to lend her own acting chops to the show. Yup, 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 Flynn has a few blink and miss appearances in the show and is seen checking into a hotel in episode one, then in another shot of the subway, and she also gives pancakes to Rain Wilson in one episode. And that cute kid sitting on Gillian's lap in the subway scene is in fact her own daughter. If you want to play some more Waldo with the cast and crew of Utopia, I have another fun easter egg for you. When the characters find themselves at a big mansion with the coat of arms, there's a royal portrait hanging there of Utopia's location scout. Dennis Kelly is the man behind the story of the original British TV series, and the American adaptation has left no stone unturned giving it due acknowledgement. Kelly has very little to do with the remake of Utopia, but we do see his name in the opening credits as an executive producer. This is a common courtesy, but the creators have gone a little step further in also including his name in episode 2 in which a note saying, Call Dennis K falls out of a book. Well that's it for Dennis in the American Utopia, but this is where I get to twiddle my thumbs and drop some unnecessary trivia. You see that guy in the middle with the beard and glasses? That's Dennis Kelly. In episode 4, a book called The Case of the Vanishing Red Wolf appears on a shelf. It's a made-up prop for the sole purpose of the show, but if you look closely, the author's name is Philip Carvel. Philip Carvel was a key character in the original Utopia and was mostly responsible for engineering viruses for the network, which, by the way, is sort of the British equivalent of the Harvest. John Cusack has charmed audiences with his acting skills despite what his Twitter bio says, but much of that easy-going vibe had been missing from our screens lately. Besides leveling my excitement about Cusack playing Dr. Christie and basically pulling a Thanos in Utopia, I'm here to tell you that this is his first gig as a regular on TV. The original Utopia was a visual marvel and booted to the bone with clever storytelling. If there's one thing it lacked, then it's the actual graphic novel that set the ball of conspiracies rolling. Gillian Flynn had her own vision for the Utopia remake when she came on as a showrunner, and in the list of the few things she tweaked or added is the actual book that brought everyone together. Gillian wanted to show the graphic novel and its creepy imagery to give extra visual leverage to its conspiracy theories, the Utopia fandom, and the hunt for the manuscript. Utopia was built on the all-too-familiar premise of biological wars, pandemics, and conspiracies. But British series don't usually run as long as American shows do, and this reboot has already signaled that it will carve out its own path. 
While writing the script for Utopia, Gillian Flynn was in constant touch with Dennis Kelly, and according to Flynn, Dennis was more than fair game for her to make changes to his story. He told Gillian that the show had a right to explore different ideas to truly classify as a remake, and you'll see that Gillian uses the OG Utopia story as more of a starting point. The idea is to use the original show as a launch pad for the American series, so the only similarities you can expect between this and that Utopia are the main characters and some of the central premise. One of the biggest complaints against the new rendition of Utopia is that it doesn't hold a candle to its vivid source material. And I do believe that the British show was more crisp and more decisive in the way that it gave us strong symbolic cues to uphold its mystery. It's still uncertain what the new Utopia's true thematic purpose might be, and we can only wait until the next session to see it play out. But to her credit, Gillian's attention to the comic book lore in the reboot is commendable and worth appreciating. Utopia's graphic novelist, Joao Ruiz, did such an amazing job with the comics we so frequently see in the show that it's hard to believe that they were made by an ordinary man hidden in a basement. Whoever ends up being Jessica's dad slash the creator of Dystopia and Utopia has a mighty job of delivering a convincing act as an abducted artist. When Dennis Kelly was brought on to develop the story of Utopia, the rough idea was to hide a conspiracy theory inside a graphic novel. Kelly took this overarching theme and created what we recognize today as a strange, thought-provoking visual masterpiece. I mean, the more you look into it, the more you understand why Dennis Kelly's series has such a cult following. It was a little silly at times and had more than a few instances of excessive violence, but it pulled off the sensational job of tangling up a gang of comic book fans with an insidious organization while maintaining a distinctive tone and purpose. Gillian's remake is intentionally different and far less subtle than the source material, but it follows this theme of twists and conspiracies closely. A lot of time has passed between the ending of Kelly's Utopia and this remake, so I think it's worth keeping an eye out for how the new Utopia will use the source material Material to drive the quest forward in a different direction. When Jessica Hyde walked into the show in episode 1, I knew this girl was going to stir up some trouble. But I also thought that she was on the receiving end of it in a tortured protagonist injected with viruses against her will sort of way. And don't get me wrong, she does have a lot of messed up stuff done to her, which is revealed as the new episodes start rolling in. That said, I'm almost certain that there's more to Jessica than we know so far, and the show is going to lean into her darker side as it moves forward. Creating antiheroes with flawed personalities that audiences can still warm up to is a hallmark of Gillian Flynn's creative style, so I'm sure that the cliffhanger with which season 1 ended will bring Jessica's secrets out from hiding, pun fully intended. It's not easy to keep up with the twists and turns in Utopia's plot, and even if you did, there's still some ambiguity as to who the real Mr. Rabbit is. The first and most obvious suspect is Dr. Christie, and Jessica confirms this when she sees his tattoo. But what good is a conspiracy thriller without a red herring? Kevin has a terrible track record in basic human ethics, but he thinks his population control tactics are for the greater good. Not fair enough, don't dig that, still not cool. But Milner walks up on the scene as Jessica's live-action blue fairy and completely turns the tables, making Christy seem like a simple cog in the system she rules. It's Milner who's been manipulating Jessica all along, keeping Jessica's dad hostage and harvesting a new society that would supposedly be free of all evil. So, if you'd consider the rabbit as the evil mastermind of bio-warfare, all fingers would point towards Milner. If you believe that Milner is a higher level level of unhinged than even Mr. Rabbit, it's your boy John Cusack who has a share in her skeptical fantasy. And uh, symbolically speaking, it wouldn't be wrong to call Jessica herself the test rabbit due to all the viral cocktails injected into her. The first season of Utopia left a lot of questions behind, which I'm sure the show will answer creatively when it's back. Gillian Flynn vaguely spoke to Variety about her plans for revealing what Agent Milner's deal is, so we can expect to know more of her backstory in the next season. There's also the whole premise of Jessica's father waiting to be unpacked, so my speculation for season 2 rides heavy on the Jessica Milner dad triangle. But other than that, another big question beyond the Harvest bubble that begs asking is how big of a hand have the Harvest guys had in all the epidemics that America, or maybe even the world, has seen. 
Utopia started on the high note of tracking things like Ebola, MERS, the Heartland virus, and the next Zika down to an obscure graphic novel. And then it spiraled into a crazy manhunt while I was busy drawing parallels between the series and the real world. One of the things that didn't fly past me though was the callousness with which Wilson Wilson put faith in stuff. Someone who jumps on one conspiracy bandwagon could so easily be convinced to buy into another one and that's exactly what he does towards the end. And that's why when I saw Wilson ride off into the sunset with Becky and Kevin Christie, I couldn't help but wonder if he's going to be the next Mr. Rabbit. As demonstrated by Wilson Wilson, a lot of backs were turned in Utopia and more betrayal could be waiting around the corner for the next season. But Arby coming over to Jessica's side wasn't a simple act of kindness. It was enveloped in the more significant premise of Arby being Jessica's real brother. In the original series as well, Arby was revealed to be Jessica's older brother and the first child their father carried out experiments on. In both shows, Arby's name comes from the initials R and B, which stands for Raisin Boy, and the trauma he was subjected to as a child turned him into a cold-blooded killer. This information, coupled with Kevin Christie's statement that Jessica quote-unquote belongs to him, builds up a strange twist to Jessica's true lineage. The most important theme hidden in layers of meaning in Utopia is perhaps the fraught concept of home. Beyond its violence and engineered epidemics is the sense that every character in the show is flawed in one way or the other. This idea is projected onto the concept of the harvest, which is an incubator for essentially making less flawed humans. The place is a breeding ground for human experiments as well as a training ground for young assassins. Den of Geek rightfully summarizes this in their article on Utopia and calls the harvest a grand social experiment. Gillian Flynn loves the idea of Jessica having a dark side, but the reason Jessica can shoot Sam in the head without batting an eyelid stretches beyond Flynn's preferred way of creating characters. When she was in captivity in the Yellow House, Jessica was gassed and inoculated with God knows how many different strains of diseases. The cookies she remembers eating could actually have been those little discs with QR-coded germs, and her presents were actually scores of enslaved children. There is very little enjoyment in checking a show for realistic accuracy when it revolves around conspiracies and plague bunnies, but I did a double take while watching one of the scenes anyway. Some of the accusations about Utopia being a weak remake might be a little premature, but that doesn't mean the show doesn't have its share of flaws. This might not agree with everyone, but I was wondering why Rod and Arby took out Wilson's eye so awkwardly if they were committed to getting answers. Why don't they get both his eyes? Are they not trained serial killers? And if they aren't going to do this the unsloppy way, why take the extra care of pouring bleach on exactly one eye socket? So I dug around a bit and found the same scene from the original show, and look at how efficiently they pull the entire act off to build onto the horror of what's about to happen to Wilson. I hate lingering on the situation with Wilson's eyesight more than I want to, but the whole premise just brings up serious inconsistencies. Like, why does Wilson miss the shot when he's trying to fire at Rod when he was able to see the gun well enough to pick it up? It doesn't look like Rod is moving around fast enough to duck the shot anyway. Plus, when Wilson manages to escape and gets in the car with the gang, it looks like he can see just fine once again. When Ian, Becky, and Stearns finally get a grip on things towards the end of Utopia, they're faced with the ginormous task of burning down the vaccines. I'll admit that this scene was very entertaining to watch, but wouldn't it be easier to just burn the place down instead of listening to a literal child? While Mike Stearns is left to finish annihilating the vaccine warehouse with Grant and the gang, we head over to his place where Wilson is cooped up with Dr. Kevin. This is where the feeling that Wilson might switch teams really starts creeping in, because he could easily be swayed by Dr. Christie's ideology. Maybe this feeling lingered all the way till the end of the show, because I can't put a finger on what Michael would do with the mother egg he escaped with. He could be aiming to create an antidote for starters, but it's more likely that this responsibility will fall on Jessica's shoulders. Utopia ends with echoes of Stay Alive, Jessica, which goes all the way back to the original Utopia tagline. The myriad of scars and marks on Jessica Hyde that we get a closer look at at the end are only partly in response to her getting bit by the plague rabbit. Due to the myriad of experience that were carried out on her while growing up, Jessica's blood is an important asset of genetic clues. This makes me more confident that she won't die so soon and come back for the next season, because she could literally hold the cure to the harvest-driven epidemic. 
With Stearns on the run and Becky in the gullible hands of Wilson and Dr. Christie, it's exciting to think of where the plot and characters will find themselves in Utopia Season 2. To put everything into perspective, Jessica will be in the hands of Milner when the story picks up in the future. Becky will be stuck with Wilson, Christie, and Thomas, while Ian and Alice are on the run. What I'm really looking forward to is the extent of Agent Milner's involvement in the viral scheme of things and how the show will delve into a different arc for Season 2. Utopia ended on an exciting cliffhanger, so let's take a look at the loose ends that might be tied up in the projected second season. Mr. Rabbit's identity might finally be revealed, and the looming question of what Jessica's dad has been up to should ideally get an answer. Well, that's the end of my time with you today, guys. If you're enjoying our videos, please subscribe and hit the bell icon to get the best out of Screen Rant.